integrationist. She was an American in the best sense, but not yet a revolutionary. Integration, integrate, assimilate, all into whiteness. That field, that space, that scene of somebody's dream nightmare.
enter each room, shook hands, and then spoke. Prison, the library, reading, reading, reading. China suffering under English rule. Japan at the end of World War II. Colonialism, nationalism, solidarity, unity, liberation, not integration. When Malcolm came to Yuri in 1964. Hello, my name is Reiko Nakayama, and welcome to Nihonmachi Outreach Committee's 41st Annual Day of Remembrance. For the last 40 years, the event has been held here at the San Jose Buddhist Church Betsuin. Although you can't be here with us because of health reasons, we know you are here in spirit. We are also taking this opportunity to showcase historic locations in San Jose, Japantown, and the surrounding communities. Each segment will give you just a brief glimpse of our community and our unique history. The San Jose Buddhist Church Betsuin was founded in 1902, and this particular temple was completed in 1937. It was modeled after the famous Byodo-in Temple in Kyoto, Japan. It served as temporary lodging for Japanese Americans returning to San Jose after their release from World War II concentration camps. 
And right now, inside this historic temple, we have Rinban Gerald Sakamoto, who will offer the traditional aspiration. My name is Gerald Sakamoto. I'm the minister of the San Jose Buddhist Church Betsuini. Uh, this year's Day of Remembrance uh, asks the question, how might we unify our communities? How might we bring our communities uh, together? Uh, how we might be able to express our own history uh, as an example of how we might be able to resolve the challenges that we uh, face. But I think what we need to do uh, is to be what we would like to be, uh, that is to be compassionate and kind, that we treat one another not as an other, but as ourselves. I mean, that seems to be an old lesson, but yet at the same time, uh, we are unable to uh, find uh, this very common value that all life uh, holds dear and important. It doesn't matter what community you came, you come from, uh, compassion and kindness uh, is important. It allows us to survive and thrive and continue. We cannot legislate uh, compassion. We can try. Uh, but it, it is a reminder for us of our uh, behavior. In the Hawaii uh, Constitution, I was uh, told by Kathy uh, many years ago uh, now uh, and that it's included uh, in their uh, Constitution. And it reads as follows. Aloha is more than a word of greeting or farewell or, salut or a salutation. Aloha means mutual regard and affection and extends warmth and caring with no obligation in return. Aloha is the essence of relationships in which each person is important to every other person for the collective existence. And this is embedded in their constitution. It is something that perhaps we can learn from and perhaps in other indigenous communities, the knowledge that we can gain uh, from the need to uh, survive, to continue, requires us to be kind, be compassionate, to acknowledge the other. How might we unify our communities in this very challenging time? We must be kind and compassionate. Again, thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts with you. I'm standing in front of the Japanese American Interment Memorial Sculpture by Ruth Asawa. She was 16 years old when she and her family were forcibly removed from their homes and her community was torn apart. Ruth's sculpture captures this defining moment for the Japanese American community. Each year, we gather to remember that great civil liberties tragedy that led to the incarceration of 120,000 people of Japanese descent. And importantly, to reflect on what that event means to us today. The theme of our program is Confronting Race in America, Unifying Our Communities. Although many of our communities have been suffering from the effects of racism for generations, People outside of these communities are finally realizing that there are enormous disparities throughout our society due to race. Many people have taken action to try to confront these issues in the struggle for racial and social justice. Since one of the driving forces behind the World War II Japanese American incarceration was attributed to racial prejudice, many Japanese Americans feel compelled to join with other communities in their fight for social justice. One such person is Alice Hikido, who was incarcerated as a child in Minidoka, Idaho, and is now a San Jose area social justice activist. I'm honored to present Alice Hikido. Today, on this 41st commemoration of the Day of Remembrance, 
we remember our immigrant parents, the Issei's, who left their homeland to forge a new life and a nation that provided a vision for a better future. They worked and sacrificed so that their vision could become a reality for their children, the Nisei generation, my generation. The war and the incarceration almost shattered this vision, but did not extinguish it. I was a child of nine when I was sent with my mother and my three siblings to Minidoka internment camp in Idaho and was imprisoned there until I was an adolescent of 13. The first Christmas we were in Minidoka, which is a, yeah, you know, you're away from home and you miss everything about home and, and, and uh, home just takes on a special place in the imagination of a child that's taken away from home. And, uh, anyway, this package came to us and it turned out to be a Christmas gift from a family friend uh, from Juno from back home. And then there was this, this beautiful blue dress. And then I was able to wear it for that class picture. And I know from the smile on my face, I was so proud to wear that blue dress. And it was not only for that, but because it was a reminder that you no know, friends at home hadn't forgotten us and that we still had a connection to home. When the call came out for uh, volunteers to uh, join, to be, become part of the 442nd uh, Infantry Unit. My brother, who had just graduated from high school, uh, wanted very badly to enlist. The idea of something happening to my oldest brother was more than my mother could bear, and she pleaded with him not to, uh, to enlist. And in this photo, um, it shows him coming back to Minidoka on a furlough. My mother still uh, was very concerned that something was going to happen to him and he wouldn't return. And just prior to the war, I had a brother in my, in my family that, that, had, that we had lost. And so these tragedies of losing family members were still very much fresh in her mind. Even though I was very young at this time, I was aware of the mental stresses on families. A tragedy stays in my mind of the mother of a family in our block becoming so depressed that she never ventured out of her barrack room. Her family would bring meals to her and we never saw her. In the next barrack was um, a mother of the family and um, she disappeared. She disappeared from, from our, our block and uh, the family must have been aware of um, the stress that she was under. And we, our block was very close to the edge of the, the perimeter of the camp. And I can remember all of us running down from the block, running to the edge of the, um, the camp, going through the um, barbed wires and going a little further down, we're all running uh, to um, the Snake River. We, the Snake River was right outside of that part of the camp. And sure enough, she had, she, what she had done was she had weighed down her uh, body with stones and uh, had, had waded into the water and drowned herself. And I can remember that, I can remember that and feeling that uh, how, uh, you know, how, how the stress that some people were under. And then kind of connecting with my, my mother, wondering what kind of a stress she was under. Would she do something like that at some point? For the majority of this period, my father was separated from us, a prisoner in an all-male justice department camp in New Mexico. This was not too different from families currently separated at the southern border by our government. Children taken from their parents to punish families who were seeking asylum and a safe life. When I think of them, I remember the yearning I had for my father in those uncertain times. And so I can identify with the pain and confusion of these children. It is disheartening to know that nothing was learned from our history. And again, an ethnic group was targeted. We are at a time when our nation is slowly coming to terms with its history of racial tension and discrimination that is tearing the fabric of our country. 
the police brutality that culminated in the killing of George Floyd brought to the forefront of our nation's consciousness the necessity for each of us to own the injustice to our black brothers and sisters. As we come together for this day of remembrance, we, the Japanese American community with our own history, are given the opportunity to speak up loud and clear. I am heartened to see many in the Yonsei generation children of the Sunsays, participating in the Black Lives Matter movement, and also giving support to the effort of Tsuru for solidarity and protesting the immigration policies of family separation by the Trump administration. In 2018, the San Jose Nikkei resistors held a vigil in front of the Issei Memorial Building here in Japantown to protest the separation of families and placement of children at Fort Sills, Oklahoma. This family trauma stirred up my memories as a child in Minidoka. As I spoke out in protest at this vigil, it is a reminder that all of us can stand up and give voice to speaking out against injustice. Every voice counts and can make a difference. My name is John Jang. I'm a composer, pianist, and director of a lot of music ensembles. I live in San Francisco with my spouse, Joyce Nakamura, who also used to live in San Jose, Japantown during the 1980s. After I attended a very moving Dave Remembers program in San Jose on uh, February 15, 1987, I was inspired to compose Reparations Now Concerto for Large Ensemble and Taiko. My ensemble, the Pan-Asian Orchestra, recorded and performed this work in Europe, New York, the Pacific Northwest, the San Francisco Jazz Festival, and DOR programs in San Jose and San Francisco during 1988 to 1990. The Taiko performer in my ensemble was Susan Hayase, who was a member of the Neomachi Outreach Committee and the San Jose Taiko Group. Another music work born in San Jose was inspired by the Justice for Melvin Trust campaign. On May 4th, 1985, a white undercover San Jose police officer stepped out of the front driver's side of his car and walked around to the front side of the passenger where Melvin Trust, a 17-year-old black high school student, was sitting. The white police officer shot and killed Melvin Truss. The white police officer was not punished for any wrongdoing. It was an act of legal lynching. In response to this act of legal lynching, saxophonist Francis Wong, who lived in San Jose, Japantown at the time, composed and recorded Prayer for Melvin Truss with my ensemble. On December 2nd, 2015, one day after the 60th anniversary of Rosa Parks' act of civil disobedience. Mario Woods, a 26-year-old black man, was shot and killed with 20 bullets by four San Francisco police officers. The four police officers were not punished for any wrongdoing. It was another act of legal lynching. In response to this act of legal lynching, I composed a work entitled, Why Did They Have to Shoot Him So Many Times? for Mario Woods and his mother. This work is on my latest CD recording, The Pledge of Black Asian Allegiance, which is available on Amazon. There needs to be seriously, 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 a national conversation about race and racism in the United States. Thank you, San Jose DOR, for inviting me and my music.
your words. Philandro Castillo Jessica Williams Nelson Sandra Bland Tavia Rice Trayvon Martin Mike Brown Hi, I'm Vicki Takeda, board member of the Japantown Community Congress, the Japantown Neighborhood Association, and a San Jose State alum. As young adults in the 60s and 70s, we found ourselves at a time where students and community activism linked arms and met at the crossroads in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement to challenge the social injustices towards people of color and the institutional narratives of our nation's history. Our local colleges and universities provided platforms where the nation's narrative was challenged with demands for inclusion by students and our community of color. UC Berkeley students pushed the envelope on freedom of speech. San Francisco State's Third World Strike Liberation Front demanded the inclusion of ethnic studies. And in the summer of 1968, San Jose State University became the epicenter in a collision between social activism and sports. Several decades before Colin Kaepernick and other athletes took a knee to protest systemic racism and violence directed at African Americans and other communities of color, there was Tommy Smith and John Carlos. At the 1968 Summer Olympics, San Jose State University sprinters, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, raise their gloved fist in a black power salute. They removed their shoes to symbolize black poverty as they stood on the metal stand. 
This past year, many Americans took to the streets demanding an end to the systemic racism and violence perpetrated against African Americans for generations. I would now like to introduce the Reverend Jethro Moore of the San Jose NAACP, who will continue the conversation on these topics. People say defund the police and everybody gets up in arms and so we're going to not have less police. Um, we're, the police aren't going to be able to protect us. That is not what defunding the police meant. And so I've tried to work with people, say, let's change the, the, uh, the word to be purpose or to uh, 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 descend the fund because police aren't adequately trained to handle mental health cases. So take them out of the mental health building. So take that segment of money from the police and put it in a mental health response group. That's all it's saying. It's also saying, let's, there is no reason for our police department to drive tanks. I mean, and they call them rescue vehicles. And in the event that something happens, we have to go in and rescue somebody. But the majority of the time I have experienced them being used, it's being used on the people. And so um, um, that comes to a, a grave concern. So there's no reason for such a strong military force. We have a National Guard. We have reserve that in the event that we have to have some type of uh, extreme circumstances, you have the, you have it already. Uh, so there's no reason why we need to get to look at the plan, the military plan that gives our, our, our police departments all this excess military wear that then they have to maintain and um, um, train on, which takes away more funding that would be better used for a different program. Um, that's what it's saying. So when we look at police reform, they're, 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 it, it, it's, it's so important to us because historically the police department has been used to keep down uh, this San Jose May 29th will live long and infamy for me to keep down what was to me was a moderate at best um, demonstration. Um, the thing was, why did they abandon City Hall? I, from the first place when I got down there, there was no one down there and then come in with all the heritage the heavy material and have uh, Eric, uh, I believe the guy's name was uh, the, the police officer who jumped out the van and was more into instigating the issue. And then we turn around from that and uh, um, he's not fired. He's still with the police department. Now I'm supposed to trust him to deal with the kid or my son in four or five years on a traffic stop. And then they'll say he did not instigate your son, but he has a history. So we should have fired him. And then San Jose would not have be so high on the payout for um, um, wrongful police treatment of citizens as we are. $15 million we paid out um, from our police department, that's too much money. So uh, police reform is very important. So again, defund means repurpose the money into other areas of community service that'll do us much, much better work in the long haul versus uh, um, militarizing your police. Uh, really um, just repurpose and take money that we've been putting in police department for militaristic reasons and put it back into the community to better serve the community. And I also want to talk about the, the scholarship. We said that we put away uh, uh, X amount of dollars, how many kids we could send to college on a scholarship that are low income. Uh, once we educate our kids and our people, we'll be a much better society. So again, take some of the money from the police department and put it in a uh, scholarship fund and um, forward that on to uh, uh, progressing kids in low and impoverished neighborhoods to better. Um, uh, this COVID-19 exposed just how brash we are with not having um, Wi-Fi throughout certain parts of San Jose and the county, as far as South County is concerned, where people of low income or and the kids are getting further behind in school, because of poor connections. And so there's there's so many reasons that we could move our money elsewhere to take care of American citizens who are the taxpayers than putting cops in full uh, military regalia, even though the law just passed that they're not supposed to wear it. Uh, we'll see. 
we are, and uh, uh, this is not anything against any particular set of Americans or even, even our white brothers and sisters, but um, people of color, um, Native Americans, Native Indians, uh, Asians, uh, Latinos, Jews, and Blacks, we are like a super American, right? We, we are the super Americans because everything has been thrown to stop us from practicing or being completely part of this American dream. They've done, they've thrown everything at us. They've uh, I've done everything they can to keep us from fulfilling it. You have. And as a Black person, um, I'm so happy with what we did with uh, Asian Law Alliance in Santa Clara and, and getting it into six districts. That was such a traumatic win that that people of color across Santa Clara would not have a chance to actually run for office in any other city in this county that isn't having district elections. Um, um, we're looking for you and we're going to look and see how your elections are as well. And if it's fair across representation uh, uh, from your communities and not a certain group who's been in power forever. Um, for my Asian brothers and sisters, my Latino brothers and sisters, and, and, uh, and any brothers, the Filipino brothers and sisters, people of color, the POC crowd, uh, it's hard sometimes to understand we belong to a country that often doesn't accept us. Georgia was a last, as a best view of what that represented. So I like to think or believe that the people across this nation, the good people in this nation stood up and supported Georgia. As I went down was a poll monitor uh, on November uh, 5th, I believe it was. And so um, there were people from everywhere coming to that state, try to encourage them, despite what's going on in the state historically, it's time for a change. And so we have to look at our commonality and remember this. We have to look at these as watermarks everywhere on why um, are they refusing to accept the outcome. And so we have to be aware here in our city and in our county, those who support those parties that have that ideological uh, approach of not accepting the election, we must assure together as a community that they never get in office here. Um, so that means uh, almost whatever we need to do to get somebody in place to run against them so that our communities collectively, and that includes the good, I say the good uh, white, the good Europeans that understand that we just want a nation where we're all equally accepted and equally given a chance. And um, as long as they have all the judges, as long as they have all the politicians, as long as they have all the sheriffs and, and all, the, all the people in power to continue to control and push through things that are unhealthy for the community as a whole, um, we cannot be complacent and we must stand up against it. We just want level playing fields. And again, all we want for Americans, all we want as Americans is for our kids to and our families to live in a safe home, have great schools, and have opportunities to get jobs and follow their dreams and to be judged as Martin Luther King said, by the content of their character, not by the color of their skin or by what their name is. That's what we all want. Um, Maslow, those of us who went all of the school, we, we all have the same hierarchy of needs. It's nothing different. And I think I probably used this analogy before, but I tell everybody always again, when you get sick, if I needed a kidney today, I don't lay in the hospital and say, wait for the black kidney that shows up. Give me the kidney that comes as a match. So when it's only that they use our DNA or, or, or whatever other blood samples they use to, to find a common match, that should tell us something in itself. We all have more in common than we have differences. Let's do more to study and look for the commonality in our humanity to make Santa Clara County the pristine place, I um, will say, uh, that we want it to be. Uh, Tamir Rice is 12 years old, at a park, playing with a, a plastic handgun. 32 or 24 seconds before the cop pulled up, the kid is dead. You can watch our complete interview with Reverend Jethro Moore on the Nihomachi Outreach Committee YouTube channel. You can hear Reverend Moore talk about many topics such as police accountability, the rise of hate groups, redirecting funds to affordable housing, concerns over facial recognition, and Executive Order 9066. Hi, 
I'm Ladani Morikaku, a volunteer with the Nihon Machi Outreach Committee. I'm here at the corner of Fifth and Jackson, the heart of San Jose's Japantown. Behind me is the Issei Pioneer Stone, a 1,000 pound granite rock that was a gift from the San Jose sister city, Okayama, Japan, the Yamaichi family, and the Okayama Exchange students in 2008. symbolizes the courage and steadfastness of the Issei pioneers who created Nihon Machi, Japantown. Next to the Issei Pioneer Stone, we have the Nikkei Lantern Monument. Lights along the sides of the lantern end at the torch at the top, representing hope. Importantly, embedded in the bend of the lantern is the date, February 19, 1942. On that date, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which changed the community forever. Each year, our traditional Day of Remembrance candlelight procession solemnly walks past this lantern in remembrance of that significant event. I've been helping out with the candlelight program for the last 28 years. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we won't be able to hold the traditional candlelight procession, but we will still honor our former incarcerees with the following tribute. Please take a few minutes now to reflect on this defining event that affected our community and what it means to us today. Amachi, Colorado, 7,318. Gila River, Arizona. 13,348. Heart Mountain, Wyoming. 10,767. Jerome, Arkansas. 8,497. Forty-six. Minidoka, Idaho. Nine thousand three hundred ninety seven. Post 
Houston, Arizona, 17,814. Arkansas, 8,475. California, 18,789. Department of Justice and U.S. Army Camps. I'm Becky Shibayama, and I'm with the Nihon Machi Outreach Committee and the Campaign for Justice, Redress Now for Japanese Latin Americans. I am standing in front of the Civil Liberties Monument on the grounds of the historic Issei Memorial Building in San Jose, Japantown. The Civil Liberties Monument is one of three monuments commemorating the only three Japantowns remaining in the U.S., San Jose, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. The three sides of the monument depict the history and experiences common to all three Japantowns and Japanese Americans in general. Immigration and settlement, World War II internment, and celebration of festivals. 
This remarkable monument has images that capture the forced removal of Japanese Americans from their homes in Japantown and the surrounding areas. This great violation of civil rights and human dignity was finally acknowledged by the Civil Liberties Act of 1988. The federal act that granted an official presidential apology and reparations was a historic moment for the Japanese American community. However, many incarcerees were left out of the apology, including my family and over 2,200 Japanese Latin Americans. The Campaign for Justice continues our fight to resolve this unfinished business with the steadfast support of other community groups. We thank you for your support, and now we would like to show an update on our recent milestone victory. Hi, my name is Grace Shimizu. Today, our redress update will focus on last year's Inter-American Commission on Human Rights ruling in favor of the Shibuyama Brothers' petition for justice. We'll start with a brief video clip with an overview of our Japanese Latin American wartime history and redress struggle. Next, we'll share why the decision by, by the commission is a significant milestone. And then we will wrap up with what are the next steps for our ongoing struggle for truth and justice. Art Shibayama was just 13 years old and living comfortably in Peru when he was forced out of the only home he had ever known. During World War II, the United States government, in collaboration with several Latin American countries, orchestrated the forced removal and internment of over 2,000 persons of Japanese ancestry, which included both citizens of 13 Latin American countries as well as Japanese immigrants. Like young Art Shibayama, the vast majority were Japanese Peruvians. Shortly after the Japanese military attack on Pearl Harbor, community leaders were scapegoated and rounded up for detention throughout the Americas. In Peru, a blacklist had been generated. While not based on any real or credible evidence of Japanese subversive activity, the blacklist targeted businessmen, community leaders, and educators. In collaboration with Peruvian officials, the U.S. used the blacklist as the basis for rounding up hostages. These hostages were then to be traded for Americans held by Japan. Most of the Japanese Latin Americans were interned in a Department of Justice camp at Crystal City, Texas. But for Art and the other internees, their long ordeal did not end with the close of World War II. The remaining Japanese Latin Americans were told that they were illegal aliens and would be deported. And because the Latin American governments initially refused to allow these internees to return, over 1,000 were thus deported to war-devastated Japan. In an effort to call attention to their hidden history and to support efforts for redress, the Campaign for Justice was formed. In response to public pressure, the Department of Justice offered a settlement of only $5,000 each, just one quarter of the $20,000 redress provided to the Japanese Americans. While supporting the decision of those who accepted the settlement, Art Shibayama, along with several others, chose to opt out of the settlement. He then filed his own lawsuit, preferring to fight for both redress and a full disclosure of the violations committed by the United States during World War II. Despite his efforts, Art was once again denied justice. His case was dismissed in the final months of 2002. Hi, I'm Natsu Saito. I'm a law professor at Georgia State University in Atlanta. This opinion came down 17 years after the case was originally filed. And it tells us that the claims of the Shibayama brothers are really serious, fundamental violations of human rights. In this decision, the Inter-American Commission emphasizes that the principles of equality before the law, equal protection, and non-discrimination are among the most basic human rights, and that one of the objectives of the American Declaration was to assure in principle the equal protection of the law to nationals and aliens alike in respect to the rights set forth. The 
commission also says states have an obligation to provide redress or what we often call reparations for wrongs that have occurred even if they occurred a long time in the past. This is really a groundbreaking decision of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. It affirms the claims of Japanese Latin Americans who have struggled for justice for 75 years and reaffirms the obligations of the United States government to provide both access to information about and meaningful, quote, material and moral redress for longstanding violations of human rights. I'm Becky Shibayama, and I am the daughter of Art Shibayama. On behalf of the Shibayama family and other Japanese Latin American families, we thank you for your support, and we share this milestone victory with you. Unfortunately, this victory is bittersweet since the decision was not made during my father's lifetime. Needless to say, it is extremely aggravating and disappointing that the U.S. government still has not acknowledged nor provided proper reparations for the war crimes committed against our family and over 2,200 Japanese Latin Americans. We would also like to acknowledge the thousands of men, women, and children of German, Italian, Jewish, and Japanese ancestry from Latin America and the U.S., including U.S. citizens who are imprisoned and used in the hostage exchanges. Until there is proper redress and justice, these crimes against humanity are ongoing. The Shibayama family stands in solidarity with all groups and communities currently fighting racial oppression. Our hope is that the published ruling can help lead to no more government-orchestrated kidnappings, indefinite detention, family separation, forced deportations, and no more children in today's detention camps. While Japanese Americans were granted monetary redress with the passage of the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, the Shibayama brothers were denied access because they were neither citizens or permanent residents. And in fact, their status as illegal immigrants was created by the politics of war, the racist policies, and blatant indifference to their humanity. May we pledge our solidarity moving forward to their next steps on that path towards justice. Uh, the situations of detention, the manipulation of immigration laws, the barriers to uh, citizenship um, and access to justice, um, the rampant discrimination, um, all of these are episodes and themes that are played out in the United States and around the world, and especially in situations of forced migration. So there are a lot of lessons to be learned um, from this case, from the experience. So I hope we all draw from that experience and also from the perseverance in this case. Um, it really is an inspiration. Justice delayed is justice denied. Justice delayed is justice denied. In Art's memory and in his honor, we demand reparations for the Japanese Latin Americans. Our objective is U.S. government compliance with the legal decision of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. We want to meet with President Biden's administration for executive action to honor and comply with the Commission's decision. We want to work with the U.S. Congress for legislative action to secure meaningful redress and reparation. We will continue our work with international human rights institutions and organizations to hold the U.S. government accountable for effective compliance. We will also mobilize our former internees and families, supporters, and the public for education and redress action. And we will build solidarity among our communities, locally, nationally, and internationally by making connections with our histories and justice struggles. You can help please sign our petition to bring the Biden administration to the table to discuss redress and reparations in compliance with the commission's decision. Mobilize your family and friends to sign our petition. Volunteer with the Campaign for Justice or the Japanese Peruvian Oral History Project. Preserve and make history with us. And of course, all donations are welcome. Please stay in touch by following on our website and social media. Thank you.
Hello, and welcome to the Japanese American Museum of San Jose. I'm Michael Serra, the board president here at the museum, and I'm standing out in front of the museum because we're still in the middle of this pandemic. Normally, I would be inside and I would love to show you around, but while we're in this pandemic, we're gonna to have to shelter in place and be outside. And when you do come down to Japantown, San Jose has got a great rich history. And so we hope that you'll spend some time looking around and visiting the many restaurants and shops that we have here in our San Jose Japantown. And don't forget to include Japanese American Museum of San Jose on that visit as well. A major part of the museum describes the great contribution of Japanese Americans during World War II, most notably by the famed 442nd Regimental Combat Team, the 100th Infantry Battalion, and the military intelligence services. Many of these highly decorated Nisei soldiers paid the ultimate sacrifice for this country with their lives, while their families and their community were locked up in internment camps in the United States. This past year, we lost a highly decorated veteran of the 442nd, Lawson Sakai. Lawson was a great leader in the community, and he continued to tell the story of Nisei veterans through the Japanese American Museum of San Jose, the USS Hornet Museum, and the organization that he founded, the Friends and Family of Nisei Veterans. Lawson was also a featured speaker at the 2017 Day of Remembrance event. And to pay tribute to him, Becky Shibayama and the Sakai family have a tribute. So please enjoy this.
Hi, my name is Franco Imperial. I'm artistic director for San Jose Tyco. I'm standing here in front of the Issei Memorial Building, or the IMB, as we call it here in Japantown. This building was originally known as the Kuwabara Hospital and was built in 1910. It served Japanese Americans when there was little trust in the medical institutions of the area due to language barriers or religious differences. The hospital closed in 1934, but since then has served as sort of an incubator space for organizations whose missions are tied to Japantown or the cultural community here in San Jose. In 1998, San Jose Taiko moved its administrative offices here and has been here ever since. San Jose Taiko started in 1973 in a time of civil and social unrest in this country. Our founders did something radical. They created a contemporary performing arts company that used the Taiko to express the Asian soul of America. It's no wonder that our company has been involved with the San Jose Nihonmachi Outreach Committee's Day of Remembrance since its beginnings in the early 1980s. As artistic ambassadors of the Japantown community, Day of Remembrance has been an inspiration for many of our projects. The question we ask ourselves is how do we share this part of our community's identity in a way that brings awareness, communities, and audiences together? Here are a few of the ways Day of Remembrance has inspired San Jose Taiko over the past decade. What does it say about the Japanese American spirit when part of the response to being incarcerated was turning to art, music, and dance? In 2017, we debuted Swing Posium, an immersive theater experience putting the audience members in a fictional dance hall at an incarceration camp during World War II, surrounded by actors, music, dancers, and taiko. Without a day of remembrance or a Japantown community, there would be no Swing Posium and the ability to explore different ways to teach and understand this history. These are a few clips from Swing Posium on its inaugural tour to Humboldt County in late January 2020 before COVID hit. We involved the community as partners in casting, production, and promotion with the intention of building relationships and deepening the impact of this work. Since the attacks on 9-11, we have had members of the Muslim American community participate in our Day of Remembrance program. I'm pleased to introduce Atara Siddiqui of the South Bay Islamic Association. Dear friends, my name is Atara Siddiqui and I'm the chairman 
of the board of SBIA, the South Bay Islamic Association. I have attended and spoken at the Day of Remembrance for several years, and I'm honored to be asked to do so again today. It is still unfathomable that 79 years ago, 120,000 Japanese Americans were forced into internment camps. When a commission was formed to look into this horrific decision, they concluded that it was based on, quote, racial prejudice and a failure of political leadership. Amazingly, shockingly, and depressingly, much of what we have seen over the just departed U.S. administration, and especially recently, is based on racial prejudice and failure of political leadership. We are currently going through a time unlike any other in history. In addition to the pandemic, which has of course affected everyone globally, we have thankfully just rid ourselves of a White House which sowed seeds of hate and division and misinformation. But this nation didn't become a beacon of hope and a land of equality and inclusivity by allowing tyrants and unjust practices to continue unabated. Brave people of different backgrounds, religions, and ethnicities have historically refused to accept the status quo and put their lives on the line to effect change. Among those courageous individuals were Japanese Americans, including Fred Korematsu, Gordon Hirabayashi, and Min Yasui, each of whom fought against detention all the way to the Supreme Court. The Japanese American community showed our nation that when you are on the side of right, justice will ultimately prevail. And when they saw that the American Muslim community was also being unfairly targeted, you stood beside us and our two communities continue to be in solidarity. So we stand with you to commemorate the Day of Remembrance join you in fighting against oppression, and sincerely thank you for your past and ongoing friendship. May God bless you. Along Fifth Street is Issei Voices, a 36-foot-long granite monument etched with the words and phrases of traditional Japanese values brought by the Issei pioneers. And on top of the monument, we see a timeline that chronicles the evolution of a community, the traditions, organizations, and individuals that form the heart and soul of Nihonmachi. One of the most recent additions to the family of Japantown organizations is Nikkei Resistors. We will now hear from Tomio Hayase Izu of Nikkei Resistors. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Tomio Hayase Izu and I am a member of the San Jose Nikkei Resistors. First and foremost, I would like to thank the Nihonmachi Outreach Committee for putting this virtual event together and inviting me to speak. Although we are currently living through very difficult times, I believe that it is still important that we are able to come together to celebrate our heritage, remember the past, and look forwards to the future. On August 12, 1981, Sue Tokushige from San Jose, California was called upon as a witness at the San Francisco hearing for the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians. The stated goal of this commission was to examine the impacts of Executive Order 9066 and the internment of Japanese Americans and Native Alaskans during World War II. Sue was 20 years old with a two-week-old baby when she and her family were initially sent to the Salinas Assembly Center as a result of the evacuation order. 
In her testimony, she recalls the heartbreaking story during her transfer to Poston about a mother and her 10-day-old baby who had recently undergone hernia surgery at the county hospital. Ignoring all medical advice, military authorities had the baby removed from the hospital and placed on the train, despite the mother's and doctor's pleas. With no adequate medical attention, the baby did not survive the three-day train ride. This was only one of 10 different hearings set up by the commission, which featured testimony from over 700 witnesses and experts about the material and emotional impact of the internment camps and Executive Order 9066. Without these hearings, it is possible that the countless personal stories and experiences shared, many just as gut-wrenching and engrossing as Sue's, would never have been heard. While these stories may not be new to most members of the audience, where I imagine many have family or even personal experiences with the camps, it is clear that the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians, as well as the Civil Liberties Act, were invaluable to the Japanese American community, not only in terms of financial reparations, but in how it impacted our collective national understanding of the internment and what it meant for our country. In 1989, just one year after the Civil Liberties Act was passed, Michigan Representative John Conyers introduced H.R. 3745, the Commission to Study Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act. According to Conyers, the bill would do four things. Acknowledge the fundamental injustice and inhumanity of slavery. Establish a commission to study slavery and its subsequent racial and economic discrimination against freed slaves. Study the impact of those forces on today's living African Americans. And lastly, make recommendations to Congress on appropriate remedies to redress the harm inflicting on living African Americans. Although the call for reparations for slavery was nothing new, Conyers' bill shared many similarities with the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians, most notably in the establishment of a public commission that would perform a wide study and make recommendations to Congress based on its findings. The bill had 24 co-sponsors, but never made it to the subcommittee floor. In response, Conyers vowed to reintroduce the bill, later known as H.R. 40, every year until it was passed. In 2019, nearly three decades later, Texas Representative Sheila Jackson Lee introduced H.R. 40, which was now known as the Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals for African Americans Act, picking up where John Conyers had left off. Although the bill predictably did not make it to a floor vote, it picked up 173 co-sponsors and even held subcommittee meetings on the Juneteenth of that year. According to Representative Jackson Lee, H.R. 40 is intended to create the framework for a national discussion on the enduring impact of slavery and its complex legacy to begin the necessary process of atonement. Like the Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians, I believe that it is best to look at H.R. 40 and the call for reparations not as the end-all solution to systemic racism, so much as the beginning of a process, a reckoning with some of the darkest moments in our nation's history. Contrary to what some may believe, H.R. 40 does not provide financial reparations in and of itself. It simply begins the conversation about the fundamental legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. To comprehensively list all of the cruelty and human rights violations that define the institution of slavery would be near impossible within the time allotted. So instead, I will briefly touch on some of the ways in which the federal and state governments systematically oppressed African Americans, making reparations not only a reasonable solution, but a moral obligation. At the height of the Great Depression, President Franklin D. Roosevelt passed the National Housing Act of 1934 as a part of the New Deal, which in turn created the Federal Housing Administration, or FHA. While the goal of this new program was to increase American home ownership, African Americans were largely intentionally excluded from reaping its benefits. The FHA considered the mere presence of black families to be detrimental to property values and began implementing a system known as redlining. In this practice, certain neighborhoods that were coincidentally majority people of color were marked as too risky to insure or provide loans to. Simultaneously, African Americans that could afford it were often denied the ability to purchase homes in more desirable areas that were effectively earmarked for as whites only. Those that were successful were often run out of town under threat of physical violence, lynching, and arson. As such, many African Americans were systematically locked out of purchasing a home a leisure that was easily afforded to many white families who made up the vast majority of America's new, growing suburban middle class. Home ownership is often considered a core aspect of the American dream, as it is one of the primary means of wealth accumulation that can be passed down to your children. Without the ability to secure federally backed housing loans in desirable neighborhoods, 
many African Americans were instead forced to purchase overpriced houses on contract from predatory sellers, not entirely unlike the predatory subprime loans that helped fuel the 2008 housing crisis, which also disproportionately affected people of color. While the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Fair Housing Act of 1968 sought to level the playing field, the damage to black families and communities had already been done. Jim Crow soon gave way to the officially colorblind war on drugs, the rise of mass incarceration and racist police brutality, for which there has been little accountability, even following the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the massive protests that subsequently swept the country. It is important to remember that many of the aforementioned racist policies were brazenly enshrined into state and federal law and enforced by the police. Uh, while policies have been since stripped of any specific language pertaining to race, the overall goals and outcomes are clear. African Americans were by and large not only systematically denied the ability to build wealth and take part in the American dream, but often terrorized and beat down through both legal and extra-legal means when they dared to try. It has been 156 years since the conclusion of the Civil War, and over half a century since the height of the Civil Rights Movement, and yet the racial wealth gap remains steady with the median black American family possessing just a tenth of the wealth of the median white American family. Much like the Japanese American Commission hearings and the 1988 Civil Liberties Act sought to remedy the grave injustice of internment, H.R. 40 represents the next step in what will likely be a long and arduous process of addressing the grave injustice of slavery and the legacy of Jim Crow. Trying to make sense of our twisting collective history and finding answers to our questions if such answers even do exist, is the entire point of H.R. 40. Just as a doctor cannot possibly hope to make a sound diagnosis without first examining their patient, we as a nation cannot possibly hope to make a fair ruling on reparations without fully, an exa without fully examining and understanding the widespread economic and social impacts of slavery and systemic racism. While the potential economic and material benefits of reparations cannot be ignored, H.R. 40 and the call for reparations represent so much more than that. Reparations in this context are more than just a symbolic gesture. They represent a meaningful path forward towards reconciliation and real restorative justice. It would mean a reckoning with our nation's dark history and prejudice and pave the way towards the dismantling of both de jure and de facto white supremacy. I personally do not know what reparations for slavery might look like or what forms it may take, as that is not for me alone to decide. However, I do believe that as Americans, as humans, it is our moral responsibility to continue to fight for social justice, defend civil liberties, and uphold the tenets of the Constitution that we claim to cherish. As Frederick Douglass once said, power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. On January 4, 2021, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee once again reintroduced H.R. 40 to the House. Together, the San Jose Nikkei Resistors, Japantown Community TV, Asian Law Alliance, and the San Jose, Sequoia, and West Valley chapters of the JACL call upon all Americans to support H.R. 40 and the call for reparations. Thank you. And here, once again, is San Jose Tycho. In 2015, as an election year loomed and heightened threats to our fellow communities of color, San Jose Taiko reached out to our sisters and brothers in the Muslim American community at Aswat Ensemble to create echoes into the future. Day of Remembrance served as an artistic sanctuary where we could develop this collaboration and connect our communities in solidarity. For years at Day of Remembrance, not only have we shared our music, but we've shared our own personal voices. Our performing members take turns each year introducing each of the pieces and sharing their own thoughts as to why Day of Remembrance is important. In 2018, we were asked by Oberlin College in Ohio to perform a concert to celebrate the opening of the Gopher Broke Foundation's Courage and Compassion exhibit. Rather than only playing Tycho for this concert, we took a page from our involvement at Day of Remembrance and had each member share intimate personal connections with the story of the internment along with our Tycho performance. Here are a few excerpts from that special concert. This is really difficult for me to say I, I can own this experience because I really can't. It's not me. But at the same time, I am a performing member of San Jose Taiko, and the art form of Taiko basically comes from this experience, this pivotal moment in Japanese American history. So how was I, essentially as a Chinese American person playing Taiko, supposed to represent this and be a cultural ambassador for this? My dad is a white American, my mom is a Filipino from the Philippines, um, and 
this photo was taken at their wedding, which was only 10 years after the Loving vs. Virginia court case. So 10 years prior to their wedding, uh, this was actually illegal in 15, 16 states. quiet, um, or the super badass Asian, always mysterious. And so growing up, I was always measuring myself against this ruler. And actually, I came to Taiko through it as well, because Taiko was really interesting to me as a way of being a loud person and, and not being a quiet person, as, this, uh, I, as this, I was always uh, stereotyped to be. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, on the bottom right there, if, for those of you who have seen the exhibit, you may uh, recognize this, but this is actually the uh, Congressional Gold Medal, uh, which was given to members of the 442nd, the 100th uh, Infantry, and members of the, the MIS. We hope that you've enjoyed our program. Through our speakers and our little tour through San Jose Japantown, we hope that you've learned a little bit about our community. Like other small communities, we are faced with new challenges such as gentrification, higher density urbanization, the closing of businesses due to the pandemic, and the loss of a generation who felt the pain of racism and incarceration. Perhaps these changes are always inevitable. Perhaps the natural evolution was to discover that your community was always a part of the larger community. To learn that the struggles against racism and the attacks on human dignity targeting other communities were also our struggle. That is the gift that previous generations have given us. We're here at Wesley United Methodist Church, and Reverend Keith Inouye will give the benediction. Greetings to you this day. My name is Keith Inouye. I am the senior pastor of the Wesley United Methodist Church here in Japantown, San Jose. I do bring greetings and the well wishes of our entire congregation that prays and hopes that all of you are well. As always, we give thanks to the Nihomachi Outreach Committee for organizing and coordinating this event each year. I must confess that I so miss gathering with all of you this year. There is a kind of spirit of unity and goodness that is magnified, one that I feel deeply whenever we are gathered together physically in one another's presence. So I'm sorry that the pandemic restrictions have prevented us from gathering with each other this year. I know that we all acknowledge that this past year has been a most tumultuous and devastating year because of COVID-19, the tremendous loss of lives in our devastated national and global economy and what that has meant for so many, and then to have our great hopes for equality and social justice trampled on once more by the ugliness of the systemic racism that still exists in our nation and the increased activity of hate groups groups and the most horrifying division in our national government and the traumatic transition of presidencies. Our citizens' inability to discern truth from lies is once more on the public stage and evidenced uh, in the violent siege of our nation's capital in last month. 
we are once more recalled to the flood of fear and disinformation regarding Japanese Americans during World War II that led up to the signing of Executive Order 9066. One of the things that I have most appreciated about our annual event is the larger inclusion and diversity of our gathering. We are a community that comes together representing many racial and ethnic backgrounds, many faith traditions, many generations, and sexual orientations and gender identities and walks of life. The wider diversity of people beyond the Japanese American community that gathers each year is an affirmation that the unjust incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II is not just one people's story, it is all of humanity's story of injustice. It is an event that remembers one of many stories of prejudice and racism and social injustice remembered in our nation's history that we should all boldly proclaim never again. Friends, a benediction is a prayer of blessing usually shared at the end of a worship service or program like ours today. It is composed of the Latin word bene, which means good, and diction, which means to speak. It is indeed meant to be good words that convey hope and blessing. So what is the good word to send you off from our programming this day? Perhaps it is this. In these times of much turmoil and trouble, do not lose hope. Let all that is sacred and divine lead you forward with compassion and love and justice and concern for others. Believe that you are somebody of sacred worth and that you can make a difference even when facing troubling times. In my faith tradition, Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Indeed, I believe that you are we are. So go and be light in a world filled with much troubling darkness. Go make a difference, and may all that is sacred and holy give you courage and strength and hope. Amen.
in Harlem. When Malcolm came to Yuri, Yuri saw the truth, not a lie, not the angry, hateful man of the mass media. She saw the self-educated warrior who talked about Japanese and Chinese national struggles. She heard anti-colonial. She heard unity. She heard liberation. Integration. Not integration. When Malcolm came to Yuri 